Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So you're at your annual Christmas party, say, for instance, of your neighborhood or some other kind of a party, and you're, you don't know everybody, and you're kind of mingling around, and you're making small talk, and so what's one of the things you often say? So what do you do for uh, what? A living, right? I mean, that's a common thing that people ask other people. What do you do for a living? Kind of a non-threatening way of just getting to know someone, find out something about them. And, um, you know, we mean their occupation, right? So I'm a, I'm a teacher, or I'm a farmer, or I'm a firefighter, or I'm a pastor, whatever it might be. But is that really their living. Isn't living something much more substantial than just that, although we attach so much of our identity to our occupation, don't we? Is that really living? And is that all there is to life? Leah, bring Jordan up. So when, this is really interesting, this is how the Holy Spirit works. He brings live illustrations at the right moment. And when my son, Jordan, was born and brought into our life, uh, we had, I was on the national board for Lutherans for Life, and we had to go to the national meeting. So we had this little tiny Jordan. Can I take him? Will he scream bloody murder? No. Hi, Jordan. We're so glad you're with us. Can you say hi to everybody? Yeah. You didn't know you were going to be a sermon illustration today, did you? So I had my little tiny Jordan with me, and I was called up on stage to make uh, some presentation because I was on the board. And so I carried Jordan with me and went up there, and, and he was a lot younger than this Jordan, actually. Yeah, if you can believe that. He was, and I, I said, this is my Jordan He's hot off the press. And this little boy came up to me. I don't know, he's probably about six years old. And he looked at him and he goes, this is the National Lutherans for Life Convention. He looked at Jordan and he said, whoa, that's what I call some life. <laughs> this is life, right? Yes, not just what we do, but what God does through us. Welcome Welcome to the family. Yeah, thank you, Leah. You're such a trooper. Yeah, I think he's a chip off the old block here. Uh, yeah. Life. Life is something that's given, not taken. And Jesus teaches us something about the topsy-turviness of his economy, and that is that he came to save lives by losing life. Very counterintuitive to the way that we would write the story if we were the authors. But Christ came, and this is what shook up the world so much, to give life by losing life, by laying down his life for us. He came into this world to save a dying world through death, kind of the opposite of what we would expect. Our idea of saving lives is being the big hero and throwing out the life raft to people not stretching out arms and dying. You might remember George Patton said, nobody ever won a war by dying for his country. Do you remember the rest of it? You win a war by making the other guy die for his country. That's how we think. Saving a whole world full of lives would surely take a great big army, right? A, a lot of money, 
powerful armies, important people, all sorts of meetings and plans and preparations. But Jesus had something entirely different in mind. The greatest and most holy act of all time, Jesus' sacrificial death, looked to the world like loss, like travesty. The devil on Good Friday couldn't figure it out. This is God? He clapped and rejoiced because our God bowed his head and died. People taunted and jeered at this Jesus on the cross. Some savior you are, you can't even save yourself, let alone us. Come down off that cross if you really are God. But Jesus' love turned the world upside down. When George Washington's ragtag little army prevailed at Yorktown, effectively ending the American Revolutionary War, Lord Cornwallis could do nothing other than concede. As he and his British men marched out to surrender to Washington and the Continental Army, you know what the British band played? They played a song called The World Turned Upside Down. And actually, if you have seen, anybody here seen the the Broadway smash Hamilton or heard it, yeah, you will hear that song. It's called Yorktown in Hamilton. But we know it best by Yankee Doodle, right? No doubt expressing the feelings of this British army, the polished, mighty British soldiers, as they surrendered to this band of upstarts. Who could have imagined? Jesus turned the world on its head the day he died on the cross. He looked weak, but he was strong. He looked like the victim, but he was victorious. He looked like the loser, but he was the winner. He looked like, of all people, he needed salvation, but he was the Savior. And he taught us something about really living. Losing means living. Dying means living. Denying oneself means living. Taking up one's cross means living. Following him means living. Jesus continues his work through us. Having saved the world, including us, by his death, now Jesus invites us to be an active part of his work here on earth. He calls us to lose our lives, to deny ourselves, to take up our crosses, to follow him. Literally, to be a martyr for him, to be willing to lay down our life. And martyrs are being made around the world in places of persecution. But what about, what about right in your own backyard? What about in your workplace? What about in your school? Are you willing to do the unthinkable? Are you willing to pay the supreme sacrifice? Are you willing to lay down your life? You are. Countless Christians daily lay down their lives one moment at a time, one word spoken, one kindness shown, one Sunday school taught, one confirmation lesson at a time, one heartfelt forgiveness at a time, even when it's hardest to do. Every minute, every hour, every day, 
every second spent in Christian living is one less moment we have to give to selfishness and to worldliness. We're losing a part of ourselves daily, dying to life. A pastor I once knew died way before his time. He was 59, I believe. And on his funeral bulletin, it said on the front, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And it was a wake-up call at the death of this 59-year-old, strong, very active, very physically fit man that none of us knows what tomorrow will bring and that the eternal is the most important. So Jesus comes to kind of shake us up in our slumber, to wake us up, and to call us to this kind of denial, laying down, taking up of a cross, and following. Because it was at our baptism that that cross was imprinted on our forehead and heart to mark us as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. And every time you come forward on Ash Wednesday and again you receive that sign of the cross on your forehead, perhaps or the back of your hand, with ash to remind you that you are one redeemed by Christ the crucified, and also you're reminded of these words from Genesis 3, remember, O oh man, that you are dust and to dust you shall return. The wages of sin is death, but don't forget the rest of it. Thanks be to God. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that cross was made upon us and is continually made upon us and continually made every time you hear those blessed words of absolution which come from Christ himself. By his shed blood, you are forgiven. Now, when that cross is made over you, it shouldn't be any surprise to any of us that we are called to a life of trial and tribulation and sacrifice, and denial, and cross-bearing, and following. Jesus doesn't say, if anyone would come after me, let him skip through this bed of roses called life. No. He talks about losing your life and finding it. Well, the world thinks that's pretty crazy. And some people might even laugh at you, make fun of you, for your faith. They find it hard to understand, and they think you've checked your mind at the door to sign up for all this. But I want to remind you that God does things His way, not Satan's way or the world's way. My ways are not your ways, says the Lord, neither are your thoughts my thoughts, declares the Lord. He chooses rather than power and prestige. What does he choose? Humility and servanthood. He chooses the cross. He chooses what looks to the world like loss. But only he can turn loss into victory because that's exactly what he did on Easter Sunday. He came alive again and he reminds us that we too will live forever. So whenever we're asked, what do you do for a living? I want to encourage you to think really long and hard about that and think beyond just, I'm a teacher, I'm a nurse. Don't settle in your life and don't settle in your faith. Consider something like I lose for a living. What? And then explain what you mean by that. Not that you're a loser but that you are a Christian and you bear the mark of Jesus Christ 
and you live for him, which often appears to the world like losing, like dying. But God defines our lives today. He bought them at a price, and that took dying. That took losing a life. And he chose that for us, only that he might take it up again, that our lives might be lived in the shadow of the cross. Jesus has invited us to live in the shadow of the cross, to truly deny ourselves, and to truly take up that cross and follow him through this valley of the shadow of death to the other side, to the life to come. We are people so treasured by the Lord that he was willing to lay down his very life, to show us what living really means. And that means losing that we might live. Losing life, losing self, denying self. Paul said it best. To me, to live is Christ. To die is gain. What more could we ask for? Amen. Peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.